This is Maximilian Alvarez for the Real News Network reporting from downtown Washington, D.C. It is Saturday, January 13th. I'm standing in Freedom Plaza at the March on Washington for Gaza. Tens of thousands of people have descended upon Washington, D.C. from all over the United States and beyond to call for an immediate ceasefire and to demand an end to Israel's violent 75-year occupation of Palestine and to hold the United States and the Biden administration accountable for their complicit support of that genocidal violence. We're here on the ground for the Real News Network talking to folks about why they're here and why this is important. Uh, my name is uh, Mazen Bader. I'm a small business leader in, uh, and a father of two wonderful children and two sweet grandchildren in North Virginia. I was born and raised in Gaza, where I spent my summers playing by the Sea of Gaza with my friends. I'm also a descendant of refugees from Palestine, Palestinian village of Karatea from where my mother and father were uh, displaced, expelled in 1948 Nakba. Every morning in my way to work, for as long as cell phone existed, I used to call my mother in Gaza to hear her voice. It comforted me. But since the beginning of the brutal Israeli bombardment and aggression, all I heard and felt over the phone was the fear in her voice and the sound of constant bombardment. Suddenly our lives were reversed as I was the one who was trying to comfort her. On the evening of December 23rd, Israel bombed my sister's house in central Gaza, killing 10 of my closest family members at once. My loving mother, Aziza, two of my sisters, one of them is blind, their husbands, five of my nephews and, and nieces, including my niece Asma, who was getting ready to get married in November. My mother had survived more than a dozen wars, becoming a refugee over and over within her Palestinian homeland. They, they had dreams and lives to live. They loved and they were loved in return. Until their final moment, they displayed the generous and resilient spirit of Gaza that Gaza embodies. They left their house to make room for another displayed family and chose to shelter together instead of at my sister's house. As fate would have it, their house survived and so did the newly displayed families. But, but my family did not. Seconds before she was killed, my sister sent her 28-year-old, my sister sent her 20-year-old son, a survivor of six Israeli wars and assaults in Gaza, to deliver food to her hungry neighbors. That generous, selfish act is what ended up saving his life. My family was buried in bodies in body bags in a mass grave. We learned that second half we learned that second half of my mother's body was found the next day. She had two burials. Even in death, we are denied dignity. I'm often asked what people can do to ease our suffering. And my answer remains the same. Do what you're doing now. Speak up. I call on my fellow Americans 
to not demand, do not just demand, but force an immediate and permanent ceasefire. We demand that President Biden and the Congress to end military funding and weapon transfers to Israel that killed my family and all the other families. Thank you. Okay, so hi, my name is X Xana. Well, uh, X Xana, um, we're here for the Real News Network here in Freedom Plaza, the March on Washington for Gaza. Uh, we've got tens and tens of thousands of people here who have descended on Washington, D.C., calling for a ceasefire, calling for an end to Israel's violent occupation of Palestine. And we wanted to go around and talk to some of the folks on the street about uh, who they are, what brought them here, and what we're seeing right okay. now. So, hi, I'm 20, year old, 20 years old, I go to college, I'm descendants of people who immigrated here from Gaza. Um, I've been to Gaza a couple times and I've experienced firsthand the bombs there. And because of the pain I feel for my family and people who I've never met, but I consider my family, I'm here. I know there's no way to communicate to people who haven't gone through that what it's like, but I guess for anyone listening to this right now, since you have gone through that, what would you want to communicate to people about what life in Gaza was like before October 7th? I'd like to um, really enunciate that the bombings didn't start on October 7th. They don't just happen because Hamas some do something. They happen because Israel won an election, or it's happening in Ramadan, or it's happening because somebody wanted to leave but they couldn't leave. It's a, a daily occurrence, if not monthly, and it's not new. It's not new, and but what we are here witnessing in D.C. does feel new. It does feel like more people are waking up to this, even though we're talking about it took 75 years to wake up. But uh, again, thousands of people are here. They're awake. I wanted to just ask uh, if it feels different to you as someone whose family, this is, this is not new to you and your family. To put it in layman terms, absolutely yes, 100%. It's so much newer. As when I was a kid, it would be maybe a couple thousands at most at protests. I've never seen this in my lifetime, only of 20 years and maybe even more. But yeah, it's definitely a wake and call. And it's something that is great that us people believe in this. And I think the next initiative is to have people in Congress, in Senate, in the president's job to really view this as a really big issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I got to let you go, so I promise final question. Just for folks who are listening to this who couldn't make it out to Washington, D.C. today, do you have any final words to, to folks out there about why they should get involved in this fight and what they can do, even if they couldn't make it to D.C. today? So Palestine isn't an Arab issue or a Muslim issue or a regional issue. It's a human issue, and it's to fight for human rights, whether those people be brown, white, or anything in between. And I think that anyone who has heart or humanity should know the universal feeling of pain and empathy. And anyone at home who doesn't know too much about this, I really hope this educated them to do more research. And hopefully I'll see them next time. My name is Yasmin Al Agha, and I'm a law student at Northwestern University in Chicago. But Gaza is where I call home and where my heart lies. My family is one of the largest in Gaza. We've been there for over 500 years. We have over five thousand, sorry, we have over 9,000 members, most of whom live in Khan Yunis. Israel has shattered our past, our present, and our future. Just in the last three months, Israel killed 120 members of my family. 31 of them were children. The youngest was just a few months old. In the weeks leading up to their deaths, they suffered immensely. Two of my relatives left their home to find desperately needed food. They came back to discover 
that Israel had bombed their home and that their mother, father, sister were all killed and buried under the rubble. As the surviving brothers desperately dug through the rubble by hand for the dismembered body parts of their family members, of their parents, of their beloved sister, Israel dropped another bomb on their house, killing both of the brothers as they dug for their family. Yasser and Ru'a were two siblings, aged six and 14, whose dead bodies were only removed from their demolished home a few days ago, one month after an Israeli airstrike killed them in their home. Their younger brother, who was only a few years old, was the one who discovered their bodies. He sobbed into his mother's arms as he told her, their eyeballs are decayed. Their eyes are emptied from their sockets. This is the lasting memory he has of his two older siblings. Hundreds of my family members are now sleeping on cardboard in the cold streets. Many of us are taking refuge in hospitals and in schools. One of my family members is 81 years old and he froze to death in the street. <laughs> Elderly family members of mine put out a plea because they are starving to death, surrounded by Israeli soldiers who refuse them access to water and food and medication. They are begging for their lives. The hospitals and schools that hundreds of my family members are sheltering in have nevertheless been targeted by Israeli airstrikes. Many have been killed in these hospitals and schools. My aunt Samar went out in search of life-saving medication for my mentally disabled uncle. He's been on medication his entire life. For the first time in his life, he is off of it. He's facing severe withdrawal symptoms, seizure-like symptoms, convulsions. When she went out to find medication for him, she was shot at by Israeli tanks. She witnessed others in the street killed right in front of her eyes. It could have been her. This is the same aunt who has been volunteering, giving everything she has to help others. She goes to UNRWA schools, asks, what do your children need? She goes out, finds it, and gives it to the mothers whose children are freezing in the street. Their hearts remain pure. When I visited Gaza last year, my aunt made a handmade thobe for me, but I wasn't able to take it back with me. When my grandparents evacuated just a couple of days ago, they faced severe, severe hardship at the Ma'abar in Rafah. And still, even in the 18-hour ordeal of trying to get two elderly people out, my aunt remembered to send my thobe with my grandparents. She told me, if I can't make it out of Gaza alive, at least the Thob can make it out alive. And you will have something to remember me by. She's preparing me for her death. <laughs> Nothing remains for the survivors. Where once there were streets, businesses, and buildings with the Al Agha name emblazoned on them including my own home, my grandmother's centuries-old home. There is now only dust. For the sake of the surviving members of my family desperately clinging to life, we need an immediate and permanent ceasefire now. Permanent 
ceasefire means a free Palestine, an end to the illegal occupation. We must demand that President Biden stop providing financial, military, and political cover for Israel to continue to partake in the genocide of my family and my people. Palestine Arabia, Palestine Inna Hadiba Inna. Palestine is ours, it will always be ours. Free Palestine! Uh, my name is Kalita Macy. I'm from Warm Springs, Oregon. I'm a tribal citizen of the um, Warm Sp Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs. My name is Aisha Macy. I am a descendant of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and I'm also half Mexican. <laughs> awesome. I'm half Mexican, too. <laughs> so I, I, I represent the Wasco, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce. I, I represent uh, Warm Springs and Aztec. Uh, not at Wasco. Hell yeah. And y'all came all the way out to D.C. today. Yeah. We're here for the March on Washington and Gaza from Oregon, you yes. said? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's quite a trip. Yeah. Awesome. So can I just ask, um, yeah, if you could say a little more about uh, what brought y'all out here and what we're seeing right now. Um, so we're standing in solidarity with Palestine. Um, we share the same struggle as indigenous peoples. And we are five decades into our genocide, and they're 75 years into theirs, and we can't let what happened to us happen to them. So we're standing in solidarity and lifting them up and, um, yeah, just trying to make a difference and be good humans. <laughs> Humanity is humanity, you know, you don't have to, you, we all, we all bleed the same blood, you know, we all have the same insides, you know, it's just, humanity is humanity, no matter, you don't have to be Palestinian to support Palestine, you don't have to be indigenous to support the Indian people, you know, it doesn't matter who you are as long as you got that hope and that faith that, you know, we can thrive as, as society and you, we know we could do better and we don't have to constantly repeat old patterns that give, that's given us more oppression than ever before, you know? <laughs> yeah, we can try something different. Yeah. <laughs> We, yes, we yes. don't have to keep doing the same shit <laughs> yeah. century Seriously. after century. Well, and on that note, I mean, since I got you both here, you know, I wanted to ask the question, right? Because for our lifetimes, right, it has been nearly impossible to get this many people to care about the struggle for Palestinian liberation, the fight against the Israeli occupation, uh, so on and so forth. Right. And I feel like that has something to do with the fact that we are living and standing in a successful settler colonial yeah. Yeah. Pro yeah. project that, yeah. that literally accomplished what Israel's trying to accomplish right yeah. now. It really makes no sense. Like, why the hell do we have to live like this? You know, we're all human. We're all struggling to survive, you know, and it's just like more oppression plus more oppression. You know, it just makes makes more more. I don't know. It makes more bullshit for everybody. You know, everyone from three years old on up to 35 or 85, you know, 100. You know, they're still talking about their struggles. They're still talking about their fucking dilemmas and their money problems and their, you know, just everything. And it's just like you have to jump after a loophole and loophole and loophole just to get where you need to be, where you want to be in life. You know, I'm 22 and it's just like, the fuck am I doing? I don't want to fucking, I don't want to be here p getting p or paying this illegal, just, I don't want to pay for this, this genocide. I don't want to fucking put money towards something that doesn't benefit society. It doesn't benefit myself or my future generations, you know? So that's just, that's fucking humanity. <laughs> humanity sucks right now, but for the better, you know, we got the future generations, you know, we got all these people. I never seen so many people here in support of one thing. It's insane. It's beautiful. And just being on this side of the United States and seeing this much support for just Palestinians and indigenous peoples, you know, it's it's beautiful. I'm mind blown. And I was feeling so down in uh, Oregon because you don't see that much of that. You don't see a lot of the culture. It's a fucking desert out there. Everybody does not give a shit because they're so brainwashed and whitewashed to their own thinking of, oh, if it's not happening to me, then I don't give a shit. You know, and I've seen a lot of that within my own school. I go to college and I've like I've pointed that out to the students and it's just like, oh, we don't give a fuck, it's not us. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I'm like, holy cow. Like I was I was I was feeling bad for humanity. Like humanity's gonna crumble, but now that I see like this other side of like just people, I'm just like, okay, I have faith, I have faith all over again. <laughs> there you go. Right. I mean, you know, that's that's always the case, right? I mean, it's it's a dogfight for who gets to claim this is what humanity is and what we're about. Exactly, yeah. And right now we're fighting against people who think that the ethnic cleansing 
of Palestinians and the mass slaughter of women, children, men, elderly people, young people is somehow what humanity yeah. is about. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're right. I mean, I think we are standing amidst a, a sea of tens of thousands of people who are saying no to that. Yeah. No. Hell yeah. no. Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Like, the indigenous people have been through this enough, you know, even before I was born, before you were born, before your grandma was born, before my grandma's grandma was born. You know, it's insane of like how many years this has been going on. I'm just like, why haven't we learned anything yet? <laughs> but seems something, seems something. I also, I also think, um, so what we call, what we call Palestine and the indigenous and Indian country is the head of the spear. So once we liberate Palestine, that means all indigenous nations will be liberated. And we'll, it, it, it's picking up momentum. When we free Palestine, we're going to free all indigenous peoples, including here on Turtle Island. We need, we need to you know, dismantle this government, get everybody out, and you know, start over. I think uh, our indigenous people need to take over, for real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, on, on that note, I just wanted to sort of ask, because you started by mentioning, you know, the genocide we're watching unfold in Palestine right now and the, the, the connection that you feel to that, you know, as someone whose people were genocided uh, here in, in... And we're still here. And we're still we're here. We're still here. Right, so, so I wanted to ask if, if like... Let's hang on one sec. Okay, so I promise I'll let you guys go. But yeah, but basically, like, any final words that you wanted to say on that, like, the, the, the connection that you feel to the struggle for Palestinian liberation, your message to anyone out there who's listening to this who couldn't make it to D.C. about why they should get involved in this fight and what they can do? Honestly, the world needs to wake up. It needs to wake up. You need to see, like, this is all a colonial construct. It's been, this has been happening long before, you know, like, like the Nakba happened. That, like, the Palestinians have been going through this long before the Nakba. And so, and so of our indigenous peoples, you know, we, we got put on reservations, they got put in, re in refugee camps. Everybody needs to wake the fuck up and get the fuck out here on these streets. This could be your brother, your sister, your cousin, your niece, your nephew. You know, these people really, like, they need us, just like we need them. You know, we need each other. We, like, humanity is going to crumble without humanity, you know. So from one love to another, you know, like... You're here in my heart, and uh, that's all that matters, you know. I'm, I'm glad to be here for you, and uh, free Palestine, free indigenous peoples from their constant oppression, you know. The oppressors are going to get it. <laughs> One last thing. Um, the Palestinians sat, stood with us during, the, during, during 1975 when Leonard Peltier was going through everything on the Pioneer Reservation. They actually did a letter stating that they were with us and they were standing with indigenous peoples, oppressed peoples, and so now it's our turn to stand with them and we need to lift them up. Hello everybody. My name is Adam. I'm a pharmacist. I'm an American and a Palestinian from Gaza. I never thought my family would live through an experience of a genocide until November 22nd, when over 100 family members has died actually by Israel. Israel took my life, my soul, by killing my 83 years old father, mother, and a brother. My father was the salt of earth. Israel killed a man who loved life, loved peace, loved people, loved nature, and most of all, he loved his grandkids. My five-year-old asked me one day, Baba Hor, all these 19 pictures you're looking at, and I have to hold down my tears. They were 19 family members, picture of 19 family members that were slaughtered by Israel. Thank you, thank you. My cousin Yasser was not just a cousin, he was more than a brother to me. And he was killed by Israeli bombing along the side of his wife, six kids, and two grandchildren. The tale of each family member who was murdered is a testimony of ongoing genocide of my Palestinian people. 
my Palestinian people whom I love, they were all killed in one day. The most troubling aspect of Israel mass killing of my Palestinian family is when they bombed the, fir the first house and my family member and friends came to assist in actually digging out the, the people who were killed and the remains of those who still under the rubble. Israel bombed them again and again until they killed over 104 of my family members. <laughs> Dozens of my family member bodies are still under the rubble. Biden, President Biden can easily put a stop to this genocide to the Palestinian people. He can easily pick up the phone and call Israel to stop this madness, stop the genocide of the Palestinian people. We call, we call on the U.S. government to end their participation, complicity of Israel crime against humanity. And we demand a full swift accountability to U.S. Israelis, officials who actually in, were involved in this Palestinian genocide. Thank you so much. Long live Palestine! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. I'm praying for the peace for the whole entire world. My name is Ala Hussein Ali. I'm a physician from Michigan. My roots and my childhood were in Gaza. I have lost over a hundred members of my family in this genocide more than 60 children, half of them under the rubble. I'm going to share one of the stories that happened in November. My brother Muhammad and his pregnant wife Ruba and their three children who are small angels, five, three, and one, with my Ruba family lived with them in a Rimal area in Gaza. The bombing and the airstrikes were all over around them. So they decided to evacuate to the south with the promise from the Israeli government that it will be safe. Before they left, as you know, the Israeli government stopped the food, water, medicine, electricity, internet, phone calls, everything was stopped. The trip from the north to the south is the most dangerous trip that anybody can experience. My brother went out looking for water for this dangerous trip. And the hours go by, he never came back. He was killed by an Israeli sniper. He was shot several times in his chest. And he was found five days later in one of the hospitals in Gaza. My sister-in-law, newly wedded, still mourning, decided to remain in her home. She said, I'm not going to leave to the south anymore. Life doesn't have any meanings. Her family, her father was begging her to go with him to the south. She said, no. Her father took the rest of the family, 17 members, and they went in a big truck 
to the south. But the Israeli government decided otherwise. They're not gonna let them reach the south. Just before there, they airstrike them, and the whole 17 were killed. They were in pieces. They were collected flesh by flesh and limb by limb. Ruba lost her entire family. Lost my brother, who was his, her beloved husband, her family. She has been displaced since then seven times from house to house. Displaced seven times from house to house, from a tent to a tent, homeless, alone, with three children, pregnant in her sixth month of pregnancy, in need of an emergency C-section at birth, and no hospitals there, no anesthesia. She will face the death at the time of labor. I was planning to return to Gaza this winter with my family to see my brother Mohammed. I haven't seen him for 20 years. And he was murdered, killed with a cold-blooded soldier And the worst is I paid for that bullet that killed my brother with my money taxes dollar that I pay every year. <laughs> By continuing to arm Israel and, fall, and failing to call for a ceasefire, President Biden has my family's blood on his hands. We demand that Biden administration and Congress call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. We demand that they stop sending weapons to Israel to kill our beloved one. And we call on all of you to stand with us and hold our government accountable so our children can grow up and our families can live. Thank you and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, um, Faisal, thank you so much for sitting for, for talking with me as we stand here in uh, Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. at the March on Washington for Gaza. I just wanted to ask if you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, uh, what brought you here, and what we're seeing right now. Well, um, I come from a Palestinian family from a village near Jaffa called Salama. My um, village was uh, expelled in 1948. My parents, who had 10 children at the time, um, ended up in the West Bank as refugees. Uh, I was born three years afterwards in 51, and I grew up in the West Bank. Uh, it was a very difficult life for the, you know, my family lost everything they had, all their properties, and, uh, but uh, somehow we managed all to grow and get educated. I came to the U.S. to finish my last year of high school and stayed on and uh, worked in business for many years, and then I was retired and I worked uh, exclusively uh, for uh, on the museum, which I founded uh, five and a half years ago. And uh, what you're seeing here uh, is a big demonstration where people are coming out to let the administration and the representatives uh, in Congress to wake up, wake up. The whole world is standing with the Palestinians in Gaza 
and against the genocide. Meanwhile, our administration and our representatives, the majority of them, are still unaware, or at least they pretend they're unaware, that there's a genocide going on. And according to the Genocide Convention, they can be complicit in that. And anybody that's, that knows about a genocide and does nothing about it uh, could become a complicit and can be uh, prosecuted and, and, and tried for for genocide. And Faisal, given what you and your family have been through, mm -hmm. and given how far back that pain goes, um, you are living proof, right, that the the violence of Israeli occupation did not start on October 7th, no. right? So what does it mean to you to be here in Washington, D.C., seeing so many people finally taking this cause? Well, it, it is heartwarming because for years and years and years, you know, we watched as nobody, nobody uh, reacted, nobody raised a finger to help uh, Gaza, but we're seeing a a significant change among the American people. The American people are finally realizing what's going on and we're seeing a lot of support for Palestine, particularly in the young generation. Uh, unfortunately, the mainstream media has not done a good job explaining to people what's going on and they have been uh, really uh, cheerleaders for Israel. Uh, the, the days of journalism in the U.S. have gone. The days of, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, the people that used to challenge the uh, and speak to uh, power and, and, and challenge their stories and cross-examine them. Now, the CNN reporters, they just nod their head up and down when the Israelis are telling them a bunch of lies and things that even a seven-year-old can tell that's false and made up and contrived. And I wanted to just ask, because I, I don't want to keep you for too long, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, you are the director of the Palestine Museum. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could just say a little more about that and the importance of institutions like that yes. to, to educate people here in the United States about the struggle for Palestinian liberation. Yeah, I founded the museum five and a half years ago. At that time, uh, there weren't any Palestinian museums in the Western Hemisphere, period. At the same time, there were 77 museums in the U.S. that support the Israeli narrative. Uh, so it was very important for us to fill that vacuum and create a, an artistic presence for Palestine in the U.S. And our mission is really to tell the Palestinian story through the arts. Uh, we feel that the arts uh, is a more effective way to communicate with people. Uh, and uh, we, we believe that um, our, ro our job is really to humanize the Palestinians because, like I said, the media had dehumanized us and marginalized us and ignored us unless there was something bad to say about us. And that, that is changing, not because of the media, but because of the people and what's going on with the social media. People are bypassing the mainstream media. Young people are not watching TV. They're not reading the New York Times. They're, they're watching Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And, uh, and that's where all the feeds from Gaza are coming straight. So by bypassing the, um, the biased media, uh, the Palestinians are able to tell a story through social media, and more importantly, through the arts. We have exhibits. We have exhibits in, in, at the Venice Biennale in Italy, and we have an exhibit starting in London. And we do a lot of online programming every weekend. So we, we, our voices are being heard by a large number of people globally. Hell yeah. Well, solidarity with you in that fight, brother. As the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network, we very much see ourselves as part of that fight, right, to get the voices of Palestinians Great. out there. And so I just wanted to ask by way of rounding out for folks who are listening to yeah. this right now who couldn't be in Washington, D.C. Yeah. today, do you have any kind of parting words for folks out there about why they should keep the fight up and what the ultimate goal should be? Well, I mean, you only have to be a human to, to see what's going on and to see all these thousands of children being killed and things destroyed. There is no question in anybody's mind that this is a genocide. And let's just call it what it is. And I know Biden and company and the, the, the most of the people in Congress have been bought out. And they're, they're, they're not able to say anything about it. Uh, and it's a shame that, that, uh, that that's going on. Uh, we, we like to see the people in Congress open their eyes and wake up, wake up. It's time for a wake up for them.
Assalamu alaikum DC. May God's peace and blessings be upon you all and our people of Palestine and especially our families and loved ones in Gaza. My name is Randa Muhtasib. I'm a new mother and a physical therapist living here in Maryland. I'm a proud Palestinian American from Gaza, the homeland of my mother. You're looking at a picture of our beloved cousin Ahmed Skaik, a dedicated husband and a loving father who is no longer with us. On October 10th, Israel ordered Ahmed's family to evacuate their home. Ahmed and his pregnant wife, Lina, as quickly as humanly possible, gathered all their belongings and their three and five-year-old daughters to flee to an area that was supposed to be a safe zone. Israel bombed the building next to them in this safe zone where they had seeked refuge. Pregnant Lena instinctively threw her pregnant body over her young daughters to try and protect them. Within minutes, Lena found herself in an ambulance with her daughters. And the only thing that consoled her while hearing their cries is that it meant that they were still alive. That being said, they were all heavily injured. Lena and her children were sent to Al Shifa Hospital, screaming from pain. During an emergency C section that was performed on Lena, she was without anesthesia. Lena had discovered that her long awaited six month old fetus son, that Ahmed never got to see, was killed as the result of the injuries that she has sustained from the blast. In fact, doctors found shards and fragments from the explosions piercing all the way down into her uterus. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ahmed was nowhere in sight. Ten hours later, his body was found under the rubble. The Israeli airstrike on the building in the safe zone murdered him. But that's not all. Ahmed was one of over 36 and counting since we have absolutely no, no way to connect with our families in the north. They were all buried under the rubble within that month. Those who survived from my family and those that I continue to stay in communication with as much as we can also endure the daily torture. Israeli soldiers abducted another one of my cousins and his family at gunpoint, stripped them down naked and brutally tortured them and humiliated them as they fled south to seek refuge from the violence in the north while they were walking down the humanitarian passages. <laughs> that being said, just before they were even able to flee and leave the north, his six-year-old son, endured a gunshot wound with a bullet that stayed in his forearm that was raising a white flag. They were following every single order to pass through safely. And yet, he had to walk with his mother after his father was abducted. A 10-hour walk on foot. A six-year-old boy with a gunshot wound in his forearm that carried the white flag that they were asked to to make sure that they stay safe but it's all lies on lies I am here today and I'm very honored to be standing in front of a crowd of people with conscience with people who are ready to speak truth to power and I'm here to say no more no more of our tax 
taxpaying dollars to bomb our homes, kill our families, torture, and ethnically cleanse our people. No more. My message to President Biden and Congress, our collective message to President Biden and his administration is to say, permanent ceasefire now! fire now and no more no more weapons no more military funding to Israel no more the people of Gaza are just like you and I my message today for everybody who's new to the Palestinian struggling is to look every day in the mirror and say, it could have been me, it could have been my family, these people are just like me, they deserve to live without humiliation, without the constant threat of bombardment, without the constant threat of a deliberate and intentional starvation on the grounds of Gaza, and finally without the constant threat of their bodies being ripped apart to pieces on their last day on earth. Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And again, I would like to finalize with, may peace be upon you, may peace be with Palestine and the people of Gaza. Long live Palestine. Salaamu Alaikum DC. Uh, my name is Willow. I'm 14. I'm from Alexandria, right across, right outside of DC. Uh, I'm here because the genocide that Israel is committing in Palestine and in Gaza right now is just absolutely horrendous. And I think that whoever, everybody who is not standing for it, are absolutely terrible people. Um, I don't even know the death toll right now, but it's. I believe almost 30,000 in what, 100 days, something like that. And it's just, God, it's, I don't even have the words to describe it. Israel has killed more journalists than were, was killed in World War II. This, it's just a attack against freedom and democracy and the world really. And. It's just crazy. I'm really glad to be here right now. I'm usually a lot more extreme than some of my family and friends are. Um, and seeing just thousands and thousands of people surrounding me and agreeing with what, with my views. And I think it's common sense, but apparently it's not. Um, well, and it wasn't when I was your age, right? Yeah. Because like when I was 14, 9-11 had just happened. And I was also in high school. But I was a bigger dumbass than you are. Like, I, I wasn't marching anywhere, right? I was buying what the media was telling me. So I just wanted to ask, like, amongst your friends and, and in your school, like, is this an issue that matters to a lot of people? Uh, it definitely is. I, I've always been very, very politically con conscious. I mean, I went to my first protest when I was, like, in a stroller. I grew up. We got mom over here who's nodding <laughs> and agreeing. <laughs> uh, I grew up going to protest all the time. At my school, it's definitely very liberal. But what I've seen is that there are still a lot of people who support Israel and just, you know, try to ignore the however many children they've killed. Um, there have definitely been a lot of disagreements over it. And I do try to keep you know, a straight face, but it's hard because there's just so many people who don't understand the atrocities Israel's committing right now, and it's, it's crazy. Well, and in terms of understanding those atrocities, I mean, um, can I ask, like, where you and other people your age who, are, who, are, who know what's going on, where are y'all finding out about that? I imagine you're not watching CNN or reading the New York Times every day. So is it is it on social media? I guess, like, how is the information about 
the genocidal violence happening in Gaza right now reaching you and your friends? Yeah, for sure. Um, unlike other people in my age group, I do read the New York Times <laughs> and watch All right, present company excluded. <laughs> um, I remember when I found out that Israel had declared war on Gaza and on Palestine. Oop, there's a child right across from me crying. Uh, I was in school. I had just entered like my first, second period. And I just saw this and I was like, oh my God. But a lot of the people in my age group didn't really find out until after school when they were looking at TikTok or Twitter, or X, X, uh, a few hours later. I do try to get most of my information from more reliable sources and people who are actually on the ground in Gaza. I know that a lot of people in my age group and older uh, just get it off of social media and that's fine. I totally understand that it's the most accessible source of information for a lot of teenagers. Uh, if I do see something on the internet, I just try to fact check it and make sure these people are not lying. Yeah. Uh, good practice. Good, good, good rule for all of us. And as someone, a, a journalist in the media, like, um, I wholeheartedly endorse this practice. And I know I got to let you go, and I really appreciate you uh, standing here in the cold talking to me. I just wanted to, to ask um, for folks who couldn't be here in D.C. today, especially younger folks out there, do you have any kind of final words, right, about uh, what you've seen here today or why you would want folks in your age group to get more involved in this fight? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, with boycotting, that's been a very, very big thing that a lot of young people are doing. You can just see the change that it's bringing. I mean, Starbucks, one of the biggest boycotting targets, is putting out deals every single day and saying that they're like, almost going out of business. And that is because of the change that we have brought by boycotting Starbucks. A lot of young people think that protesting and boycotting isn't going to do anything, but just being surrounded by like 10,000 people, I don't even know how many people are here, it's like the energy that is around here is so amazing. And it's all these people who are here for one common goal to free Palestine. This is beautiful. MashaAllah. God bless you all. You. Greetings of peace upon you all. My name is Abed Ajrami, a Gazan Palestinian American residing in Texas with a wonderful family, wife, and three children. I also have a large family in Gaza that has shrunk in size in the last three months. One of my wonderful family members in Gaza is my nephew, Ahmed. Ahmed is six foot tall. He's an athlete who excels in sand volleyball and soccer. Ahmed has a special relationship with Gaza Beach. He's in love with the sand, with the waves, and with the sea breeze. He often his, took his wife Fida, his three kids, and his 70 years old mother Halima, my sister, to the beach. There, he would teach his children how to play soccer, how to swim, while his wife Fida and his mother Halima sipped freshly made mint tea. Ahmed is now laying in a hospital bed, paralyzed. He is paralyzed from the waist down due to the Israeli indiscriminate bombing. The same bombing killed Halima, his mother, his wife Fida, and his three children, ages 13, five years old and 11 months old. You heard that right, 11 months old. <laughs> to add insult to the injury, Ahmed couldn't get the necessary medical care for the wound of his abdomen or for his broken spine nor for the emotional trauma of paralysis and the loss of his family. The Shifa Hospital, 
where he was awaiting surgery, was attacked and invaded by the Israeli troops, forcing him to hastily be transported to a hospital in Rafah, where he remains now. The Rafah hospital lacks medications and supplies, and listen to this. To this. His screams of pain were heard throughout the hospital corridors when the surgeon cleaned his wounds and stitched those abdominal wounds without anesthesia. <laughs> Ahmed knows he can never walk again. He knows he will never feel the softness of beach sand under his feet again nor the warm hugs of his mother and wife, nor hear the giggles of his three children. All of them were buried without saying a, go a final goodbye. He told me on the phone he is dying to be carried or wheeled to his favorite spot on Gaza Beach. What he wanted is to be left alone there that he would close his eyes and just imagine. Imagine his kids running around. Imagine his wife and mom sipping freshly minted tea while chatting. Feel the sea breeze and hear the sound of waves. I promised Ahmad I will be his voice, and I will share his story with y'all. This is Ahmed. So I tell you, Ahmed, I will send you this video. I will send it to his hospital bed. And I, I, as I promised, I am sharing his story with everybody here. I also promised him that someday I will take him to his favorite spot on Gaza Beach with both of us, will close our eyes, feel the sea breeze, listen to the waves, and imagine, imagine that the dead are alive, and peace has prevailed, and Palestine is free. Until then, I ask you, in the name and the names of the 60,000 Ahmeds that were injured in Gaza, I ask the world, in the names of the 30,000 Halimas and Wafas that were killed in Gaza, to please stop this madness, stop this genocide. The time to call for a ceasefire is yesterday. And we are here today, and we demand an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now. Cease now! And for God's sake, free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.